Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Animal Liberation and Human Liberation, featuring Professor Robert Portzel. Professor Robert Portzel is a national representative for Physicians Against Animal Testing and founder of the animal rights group TZELA, which aims to establish intersectional collaboration between social movements. The current network connects about 20 individual groups and organizations in the state of Bremen, Germany. In January of 2019, he was elected as national speaker of the German Greens Party for animal policies. Apart from his activism, he is also a lecturer and a researcher in the field of artificial intelligence at the University of Bremen. Robert and I have known each other since 1987, when we were assigned together as roommates during our freshman year at college. Back then, we often talked for hours and hours, and though many years have passed, we easily found a groove in our conversation here. We covered a lot of topics, including the lack of scientific basis for animal testing, alternatives for testing that don't involve animals, the ecological cost of agriculture generally, and animal agriculture specifically, the connection between the oppression of animals by humans and the oppression of certain humans by other humans, the cognitive dissonance of loving some animals while eating others, veganic agriculture, health issues related to eating animal products, the many issues with dairy production and consumption, how wild animals are sacrificed for the ranching industry, the importance of stepping outside cultural perspectives, the significance of social media communication, the relationship of capitalism to animal agriculture, reformism versus abolition in social change movements, the increasingly serious effects of climate chaos, and what positive things people can do both for animals and for human survival. If you like this episode, please share it on social media. That really helps a lot. To support the podcast financially, you can make a one-time donation to username Colibri at paypal.me or at Venmo. You can also become a member at patreon.com, where you'll get early access to podcast episodes and also some exclusive content. The background music you're hearing is by Dr. Dreamchip, an electronic music artist in Portland, Oregon. See show notes for how to follow their work. Without further delay, here's my conversation with Professor Robert Portzel. My name is Robert. I come. I currently live in Bremen, Germany, and um, I've lived in Germany pretty much uh, all my life, except for seven years that I lived in the U.S and uh, uh, some time in other cities and other countries, but Europe is where I'm from. And you are involved with an organization, it looks like, from the poster behind you? Or is that... Uh, a... Well, this, uh, yeah, this is a, a movement. Basically, this uh, uh, symbol is used by the animal rights movement, which is not really an organization, but more like a universe of organizations, which is maybe a point that we can discuss later on why there are so many and why they're so specialized. Right. Particularly in this movement. Right. Well, we can start with how it was that you came to these movements. When we uh, talked a little bit before uh, to prep for this, you mentioned that your first concerns when it came to animals and specifically animal agriculture were around ecology and environmental issues. Yeah, I, my, my my initial approaches all were basically uh, scientific or, in a, in a sense, rational. Huh? So both my involvement in a, a group against animal testing had its origins in this particular group pursuing 
a scientific argument that it's a bad method. You know, everybody was also of the opinion that it's unethical, but the main issue was it's scientifically a bad method, it produces bad results, and it hinders um, medical progress. And this was an argument for me as a scientist professionally that was uh, very, you know, opened the door for me in a very easy manner. And much like my uh, involvement in the vegan uh, groups and, and grassroots activism there, this was ecologically driven. You know? It seemed utterly ridiculous to me to feed 100 calories into a cow and to get three, three calories back. You know, that's a waste of resources that we simply cannot afford on this planet. You know, and then if you take all the the greenhouse gas emissions uh, that is produced by animal, the animal industry, um, that's another reason you know, to actually stay away from these issues. But again, initially ethics had little to do with it. Right. Now, let's get back to animal testing for a moment there, because I think that most people assume that animal testing is a good thing and that it's effective. Most people have not questioned that. And in fact, in the United States, when it comes to testing new drugs and also, I believe, new therapies, uh, the, um, the government actually requires animal testing to be done before the drug can be brought to market. Yeah, there are. Well, maybe it, it may be strange to say this, but this is one of the very few things that was good about the Trump administration is that they started the exit from animal testing. So the US and Netherlands are the two countries leading the world in, in trying to get rid of this method altogether to completely uh, uh, substitute it with uh, alternative methods. The uh, main, when we do street work, you know, we have a booth, we have, you know, our flyers, we go out onto the street and most people say, well, what else should we test on? Should we take humans uh, right. as subjects? Mm -hmm. And this already shows that not many people know that there isn't a drug that is allowed on the market that didn't go through three phases of human, human testing. This is the law, right? There's the clinical phase one, phase two, and phase three with increasing cohorts of human subjects. It's before that that we have mandatory animal tests. But to try to predict how a drug fares in the human tests based on the animal experiments is impossible. There's no <laughs> predictive uh, factor. So it's basically, you know, throwing darts while being blindfolded. You know, sometimes you hit the same result, sometimes you hit a different result. It's a completely unnecessary stage. And these clinical tests, you know, they're important. Um, but what may be even more important is to prevent it. 80% of all the cancer cases could be prevented by leading a different lifestyle. Right. You know, they're completely lifestyle based. You know, and that's 80%. <laughs> that's not a small fraction. This is this is basically the bulk of it. Right. You know? and, and so we, we are calling for a very modern approach to medicine. I think that is um, based on prevention, you know, on, on leading healthy lives. And we see this already uh, again now in the current situation we're in. You know, if you have, if you suffer from specific um, physical problems, you're more likely to have a very bad uh, COVID uh, right. time. So also there you see that having a good immune system, having you know, sort of a normal weight is is all helpful uh, for this. Yeah, but animal testing, it will, uh, our internal prediction is that we will have succeeded in 15 years. So oh, really? in 15 years, uh, there will be no more animal testing. And this is based on the way it's going now. We have computer models. I work myself in, in, in the field of AI where we, we for example, uh, sought to model the larva of the Drosophila fly. We, mm -hmm. we have a complete computer model. We can have this, this animal completely virtual with every brain cell, every cell of the body, every connection. So whatever you do to this computer model is the same as doing it to the real larva. Yeah? There's no difference between the two if you have a complete model. 
And this makes any kind of animal tests, even in behavioral you know, studies, or uh, unnecessary. Yeah? Of course, you know, let's be careful there. This is an organism with, with 100,000 neurons. So it's really as small of a brain as you can have. Uh -huh. you know? we're, you know, we're, we're a long way from, let's say, modeling a mouse yeah? on that level of detail. Yeah? That's still... Science fiction, right? Right, now. right. Yeah. And then when it does we come, can do a lot. oh, go ahead. No, we can do a lot with computers or with um, with other uh, multi-organ chips. Yeah? So I can I can perform a biopsy in, on your um, muscle, and there was a Nobel Prize in 2012 for the pluripotent stem cell. So I can take this muscle cell from you, and I can turn it into a stem cell, which then can grow into a liver or a lung or a heart tissue, whatever I want. And I can perform tests on these miniature organs. Yeah? And we even have chips with lots of these organs connected. So you have a little human on the chip. And, you, and this is completely living. We even have mini brains with synaptic activity. Um, and this is, you know, this is some cool stuff and it makes two things possible it makes a testing at a very early stage on real human tissues with real human metabolic pathways possible but it also makes a personalized medicine possible because you react maybe differently to a medicine than i would yeah? right because we are completely different individuals and some people you know have problems with a certain type of medication but not with others so this makes a very personalized medicine possible because I can test it on your liver yeah, or on my liver. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's remarkable. Yeah, so, yeah that, that, was, that was basically what my next question was, was isn't there ways of experimenting on humans without experimenting on humans in the sense that we can do skin cultures and that kind of thing? Yeah, but we have progressed far beyond cell cultures. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. so cell cultures can do a lot, yeah, but um, we have a, a database of um, 250 million um, molecules and their toxicological effect on different organs, just based on, on prior research and prior uh, knowledge. And now, if we take a new molecule and we want to see how it would react, you know, how the liver if it's toxic to the liver or toxic to the heart or whatever, you know, we don't need rabbits anymore. We just feed it into this database and by structural structural analogy, it predicts that this will be harmful for a liver or this would be harmful for the lungs. And these predictions of this database um, outperform animal tests. Yeah? And this is a sensational, you know, uh, result is that a, a computer trained model is a better predictor you know, than rabbits, mice, rats, you know, because frankly, we are not mice, <laughs> we're not right. rats, right. nor we rabbits. <laughs> and they have completely different metabolic pathways, they have a different chemistry, they have different breathing apparatus, even though they're very related animals to us, um, the differences are huge. You know? Right. Right. Yeah, I know that in the in the history of animal testing, there have been things that have been harmful to animals, but would help people and vice versa that helped animals, but that would harm people. And so it hasn't yeah. uh, it hasn't always just from that point of view, it has not always worked very well. And if you know, if you apply today's uh, laws, penicillin would not have survived <laughs> animal right. tests. And, you know, medicine without penicillin would be uh, unthinkable. Also, aspirin would not survive the animal test. <laughs> also, that wouldn't work because uh, and and, you know, it's if if you are, uh, you know, if you've had any experience with animals like you, you feed parsley to to parrots. It's a deadly poison for most parrots. Oh, wow. And for us, you know, delicious with a couple of potatoes. Mm -hmm. yeah? Give it to me. Yeah. Sheep can can almost consume as much arsenic as they want. Doesn't do them any harm. Yeah? Again, that's poisonous for us. So you find lots of these examples, and of course we have these, you know, like the contagan 
uh, scandal we say uh, in the 70s where you had you know very bad effects for humans but all the animal tests showed nothing you know? right so yeah as you say it goes in both directions right right okay so then getting back to the um, ecology and the ecology of animal agriculture you made a reference to how much energy or calories of energy are required to produce meat versus to produce vegetables. So let's talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, so I, I've just uh, wrote an essay on that. So like you, but of course I write in, in German, so uh, this is not really accessible for your hearers. But um, a lot of, um, when we talk about agriculture, I think there's the first, we need a term for people who grow plants, and we need a, pe a term for people uh, who are part of the animal industry. Yeah? So the, we need to, to distinguish the two. And the people who keep animals and they produce meat, they would claim that they're producing food. But I say this is not true. They're actually destroying food. Yeah? It's, you know, you take a factory and you deliver 10 letters and it outputs one letter for every 10 letters you put in, you wouldn't say this factory produces letters. No, it destroys letters. Uh -huh. right. And it, and then, you know, the second argument that they, they would make is that they refine the food so that the protein, in a sense, get better uh, for us. Uh, we get better proteins out of animal meat than out of, let's say, soybeans or lentils, which is also false. So the whole animal uh, agriculture is based on these two falsehoods that A, it produces uh, food, which it doesn't, it just destroys enormous amounts of food. Uh, if you think of all the soy that's being grown in the Amazon region, in Brazil, that it just ends in the trough and it doesn't end on anyone's plate. Yeah? And so we are using up a lot of um, land that would become available to just, again, forests or any kind of you know, plant life and work as a CO2 uh, sink as well. Yeah? But we're using that land to produce animal feed. Uh, in enormous amounts of animal feed that we're feeding into the animals, which then, of course, turn it into meat, but, you know, very inefficiently because they move, they need to grow, they need to keep their heart beating, all of this consumes energy. So this uh, 100 to 3 ratio is the most extreme in, uh, in cattle. Uh, pigs have a better ratio, uh, chicken even still a better ratio, and fish. But it all comes down to like whether you're saying, okay, you're getting 14 out of 100 calories, or you're getting 12 out of 100 calories, or, you know, three or four calories out of 100 calories. Um, it's, it's dismal, <laughs> you know, right. with any, uh, you know, even though pigs or, or chicken might be a bit better in terms of the, uh, or less wasteful. Yeah. Right, right. So basically, in terms of, for example, land use, we spend, you know, all this space growing food that is not grown for humans, but that is grown to feed animals, and then the animals are killed to feed humans. And so that amount of what you're basically saying is that that amount of food fed to the animals could instead feed many more humans. Yeah, yeah. Whereas you sort of there's two uh the details always are, are, of course, a little bit more. So we use agricultural land to grow soybeans and to grow corn, and we feed that to the animals. But there's also so-called green land, which is, you know, like the prairies where you have natural grass or something grows that cows can eat, yeah? but not humans. So a certain amount of the animal feed is produced by green lands. And um, Greenlands actually are, in a way, also dependent on a little bit of grazing and a little bit of, you know, the hooves of the animals will make imprints in the soil, which gives rise to certain types of bugs and certain types of birds that can only coexist 
with these grazing bison and stuff like this. So this, these are evolved ecosystems, and I, I don't think anybody is is against you know bison or buffalo or any kind of cattle roaming freely through the wilderness. Yeah? But in terms of the animal industry and and having you know not millions but billions of these animals, yeah? and about fifty percent of the land. Um, that is that can be used for you know growing crops is used for for animal uh, feed but it's not 100 percent of all the animal feed is you know soybeans and corn right. You know. right right i hear you yeah yeah and so i think one of the points to make then is that uh also that all of that land that is currently being used to produce animal feed it's not as though we would need all of that to feed ourselves if we stopped having animal agriculture on this enormous scale, and that much of that land could then be returned to uh, to wilderness and to wildlife habitat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which is um, why you know the 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 most threatening thing to uh, uh, diversity of wildlife on this planet, according to a recent Oxford study, is agriculture. So it's it's the growing of of crops you know, that is. T- you know, taking away wilderness, you know, every day and turning it into farmland. And, and this brings us also much closer to th- all these wild animals. You know, and this, again, is a story about, you know, viruses that mm-hmm. can jump the species barrier, which we have just witnessed last year. You know? Right. One thing you didn't mention yet, but that's also a big element here is water usage. The uh, well, that is uh, going to become a, an even bigger problem in, in the future, right? We we have the, you know conflicts rising and water shortages in a lot of places, and um, of course, um, the energy bill and the water bill for producing meat are huge. Uh, so again, um, if you take uh, studies. Um, in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions, um, um, animal industry is responsible for 14.5% of all the greenhouse gases that are produced by humans. Mm-hmm. All the traffic in the world, cars and trucks together, 14%. So it, it's even a, above uh, all the traffic uh, and, and the gasoline consumption thereof. So, yeah, it, it is um, a, a triple whammy, at least, huh, to, to the environment. It sucks up a lot of water. And then, of course, all the waste products. Um, we right now have a lot of um, tourism of uh, animal waste. So it's being carted all over Europe from one state in the other because uh, there's no place to, to uh, put it anymore. Huh? The water is so nitrate uh, polluted uh, that it becomes very costly to treat it for human consumption and it's a it's uh, it's a huge problem you know, especially in farming intense so where you have lots of animal farming you know what to do with all the waste right and the scale of uh, animal agriculture there in Europe is not as terrible as the scale that it is in the United States I remember reading a news story Last year, and there were some, uh, and it was about um, there was going to be an expansion of uh, some kind of animal farm. I believe it was cows in France, and the uh, you know the, some of the neighbors were upset. You know, some of them were fine with it. There was a whole discussion going on, but what it turned out was that they wanted to expand this farm in France to like one thousand cows or something, which. I, I just thought it was amazing because, you know, in the United States, there are farms, you know, that, I mean, whatever you want to call them, there's these animal agricultural operations that you can be driving by them on the highway at 50 or 60 miles per hour, and it takes you a couple of minutes to get past it. And it goes as far as you can see all these stalls, all these animals. I mean, a thousand is not the, 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 oper- the, the scale of the operations here in the United States is, is, is immense. You know, yeah. and uh, and they're they're pretty horrific to to drive by, really. Yeah, well, the Bremen where I live at the moment is just north of the so-called pig belt of Germany. So um, we have uh, 
three slaughterhouses uh, very, very nearby. And each of the three um, kills uh, six million pigs a year. And, um, and one uh, is, has 10 million pigs a year. So that makes per slaughterhouse you know, 1,400 uh, pigs a day, which is just, um, and these slaughterhouses are within throwing distance, <laughs> right. walking distance of each other. And, um, but if you drive through this area, you will never see a pig. Mm -hmm. They've completely disappeared because they're all, you know, kept in these factories. They even have multi-level uh, high rises now for the pigs. Oh, really? Yeah. And and they're doing this also in China now, starting to build these high rises, where it's just you know an industrialized process to to you know grow uh, them and and to bring them to the slaughterhouse and turn them into whatever you know, bacon. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's amazing that you can actually drive through one of the most you know animal intensive areas of Europe and you will never see an animal, yeah, because it's all indoors. Yeah. They never get out of the you know, stall or compound. Wow. Yeah. The multi-story. I hadn't heard of that. Of course, here in the United States, there's enough room to just spread them out. That we haven't had to go to those multi-stories yet. But that's, yeah, that's a whole other level. Wow. So, you know, one thing that we haven't gotten into yet is the ethics of this, of, of, of animal agriculture. I mean, there's lots of different ways to approach this. I, I would say that that uh, there are, I would make the argument that simply keeping animals confined for, for, uh, to raise them, to raise them for food is in itself uh, a bad thing, even if, as some would argue, uh, animals could be part of the human diet or whatever. I mean, that at the very least, there's a difference between someone who goes out and, and, and hunts than there is to where the animal is free its whole life, you know, uh, versus, you know, the situation we have now where there are animals who have not a single moment of freedom their entire lives. Yeah, um, yeah I, I would agree. Uh, sort of this would be a, a pragmatically unproblematic, however, um, as I mentioned, the the ethics originally played very very little. Uh, the importance was was minor, um, but it has changed over the years, and especially in this this whole activism environment, um, it's it becomes an important point to discuss. And you you stumble across interesting perspectives and and points of views. So. The, the question whether it's right to exploit uh, other sentient beings just because you can um, and whether you're eating them or turning them into leather or turning them you know, into whatever um, a, a work horse or, you know, um, this is an interesting ethical point of view. And already uh, Immanuel Kant um, speculated that if we continue so he can't postulated that we would sort of suffer if we continued to uh, abuse animals in the way we're doing it. And he would, he predicted that it would cause a lot loss of empathy. And I think that um, this, this climate uh, of, you know, while, while the sort of, Earth is getting warmer. The social climate is getting brutally cold, <laughs> right? And and levels of empathy are uh, declining. Um, I'm not sure whether you can objectively uh, measure it, but at least this is a commonly expressed sentiment. And um, we talked about animal testing before. And um, I was amazed at, uh, when I read about the uh, brown dog riots in England, where over the fate of a single dog that was used in, an, in a vivisection experiment, riots erupted in the streets of London and tens of thousands of people protested. And um, what, what year was that? This was in 1903. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So um, Queen Victoria was a, a sort of an animal friendly person. She started with the first legislations against the vivisection at the time. But people um, seemed to have um, divorced or been, become divorced uh, from from this end product that they're buying in, in, in a supermarket to uh, this used to be a, a real living individual, you know, uh, being. It's kind of absurd that uh, we, we, we started a chapter of the animal safe movement here in Bremen. It's a movement that started in, in Toronto, Canada. And this woman, Anita, uh, she was walking uh, on a hot day and uh, a truck loaded with pigs just stopped at a traffic light next to her. And the pigs were sort of putting their snouts out of the, these little slits. You know? And it was, since it was a really hot day and she had a water bottle in her hand, she just gave them some water, which caused the driver to exit the truck and to say, you know, tell her to stop it. You know? But she is a very res resolute woman. She said, no, I'm giving water to these animals and you're not going to stop me. This ended up in court. Yeah? And it went through all the Canadian courts yeah, uh, for, I think it was four or five years until the Supreme Court of Canada found her not guilty with the beautiful opinion of the, the judge who said, compassion is not a crime. Yeah. Nice. And, uh, yeah, r really nice. And this animal safe movement goes back to, to an idea by Leo Tolstoy, who said, you know, if you can't prevent a crime from happening, you should at least bear witness. Okay. So we go to these slaughterhouses uh, once every month, and we stand there in the freezing cold or in the rain. We, we just stand there and, and we do nothing but bearing witness. You know, we just look at the animals and we sort of say goodbye. That's all we're doing. You know? This is not a loud protest. We're not shouting. We're not doing anything of this. We're just sort of acknowledging the individuals that are about to depart you know, and that are about to lose their lives. And, um, the, we, and we document it. So a lot of, you know, this fight, of course, is nowadays being fought online and you, you want to supply in pictures and media um, of, of these individuals and to sort of provide the proof that they existed and shared the world with us for a while at least. And it's, um, it's very uh, interesting to have people come along and, and who are not, you know, or still meat eaters. And they say, if you if you bring a meat eater to one of these vigils, he will uh, become a vegan within days. Yeah? It's it's hard, actually. You know, if, if you think about doing it yourself, uh -huh. raising an animal and then killing it, uh, I, I don't know how many people would actually be able to do it. Yeah? But nevertheless, it's... Uh, um, for us, at least, for the vegan movement, it's it's certainly not about eating. You know, it's it's not a diet. It's really a social movement that is interestingly enough different from other social movements, because it's the only social movement that takes place without the oppressed. Ah, <laughs> so, right. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, they they really you know are not part of the movement because they have no voice you know, in a way. And um, so, um, in a sense, we're, we're surrogates, but uh, the belief that this system of uh, systemic oppression um, is actually also really bad for us as a, as a culture, as a society. You know? And that um, I remember when I was in, in Berkeley, uh, I came in contact with uh, the works of Margaret Mead. Margaret Mead. Mm -hmm. And at the time, um, I thought it would, I thought actually not so, I, I didn't regard that very highly. I, I thought 
it's a bit simplistic to think that that a society that stops killing animals would also stop killing humans uh, and that it would end wars and, and stuff like this. Uh, I think I have to eat my words that I uttered back then mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and to actually acknowledge that a lot of these, um, you know, or that this oppressive system that we have established over whatever, 15,000 years, um, is actually a blueprint for many other types of oppression. You know, oppression of women, of, uh, if you think of colonial times, or even, you know, uh, what happened in, on your continent, you know, with the indigenous populations, with slavery. You know? I mean, this is all pretty from a point of view of an animal you know these are old heads you know, being enslaved that's true uh, being even extinguished or uh, you know exterminated you, know. you mentioned tolstoy before i know that one thing he said was where there are slaughterhouses there will be battlefields yeah yeah you, it's it's interesting what you what you find that many people whom you never would have suspected sort of to to be in this also Rosa Luxemburg uh, or um, strangely enough also uh, Richard Wagner um, you know he was a the composer mm -hmm. you know big friend of the Nazis and, and all of this you know we, we we know he but he was a outspoken person against uh, animal testing and he, the a quote is attributed to him even though it's, uh, I, at least I wasn't able to find a, a real proof of, of this, uh, of him having said this. But the, the point is, what he said, or supposedly said is, you know, if we stop animal testing because it doesn't work, we haven't gained anything as a society. And, and when I first encountered this quote, I was like, well, the, the animals will not suffer anymore if we stop it because it's scientific bullshit. You know? Right. But, he's, but he pointed out that we need to do it because it's unethical. You know? We need to stop this behavior not only because it's bad, not only because it's harmful to the environment, not only because it produces you know, bad medical findings, but we need to do it because it's ethically wrong. And thus, a say, a lot of the cognitive dissonances that we just carry around with us. Uh, I mean, so many people like animals. You know, they have cats, they have dogs. You know? um, if you look at any children's room, you know, the books are filled with animals, these teddy bears, the wallpaper is, you know, basically animals all the way, yeah? bunnies and whatnot. So we are very uh, sympathetic towards animals. Yeah? And there comes a point where we are being taught, well, you know, it's okay to pet these and it's okay to eat those. Yeah? And the, for completely arbitrary reasons, you know, there's nothing that, you know, a pig is just as intelligent as a dog. You know, there's no external criteria which make one a, f a food source and the other one uh, your, your most loyal companion or whatnot. You know? And also it, it differs from culture to culture what people eat, right? Their cultures who consider dogs to be a, a delicacy and other, others who would never eat a pig. You know? So this is completely arbitrary convention, of course. But... I think something happens when you tell uh, children that it's okay actually to kill and exploit these living creatures. Uh, you, you, you're making a statement that is really the root of a lot of cognitive dissonances that, that you would have to carry a, a sort of around with yourself for, for the rest of your life. Uh, and that cannot be healthy, at least in my mind. Right, right. No, I, I totally hear you on that one. Like, I, it's interesting. I've known a lot of animal rights activists here in the United States, and um, have been, you know, spent a lot of times in, in in vegan and vegetarian communities. And I haven't heard this this argument quite as often as others of uh, how uh, as our 
as our consumption of animals has really increased, which it has, you know, measurably over the last, you know, a couple of hundred years, you know, um, that our la our empathy also seems to have, have disappeared. This is a very fascinating one to me. Of course, you know, we, as a scientist, I have to say, we have to be careful, right? Mm -hmm. We know that, you know, all the countries where people drive on the left side of the road have way more earthquakes <laughs> than countries where they drive on the right side of the road. And so you don't want to go from correlation to causation, right? right? So driving on the left side, of course, does not cause earthquakes. Nevertheless, there seems to be a connection there. So it's probably more than just correlation. And you said it increased in the last 100 years. The, there is a real steep incline in this increase only in the last 20 to 30 years. Okay. Now, we remember back, you know, when we had meat once a week, this was the Sunday roast, right? You know, which, you know, right. on all the other days, it was just not affordable. And it's the industrialization of this process that made it so cheap, you know, that, you know, it's it's cheaper to go to McDonald's and, and buy a burger than to buy uh, some broccoli at the grocery store. Right. You know? mm -hmm. and, um, this is the, uh, what's his name? It's Adrian Musk, the, the little, bro little brother of Elon Musk. Oh, I don't know. His slogan, is, his slogan is vegetables are the new Internet because the prices for vegetables are going up now yeah, because they're scarce. Ah. Demand is slightly increasing now and people like to have broccoli. But it's, you know, all the farmers that were investing in these huge corn fields and huge soy fields. Huh? And it's it's for a supermarket. It's not easy to get some broccoli these days. It's becoming scarce. Yeah. Wow. So he's he's building these containers for urban gardening. Mm -hmm. He's distributing in, in, in towns where and people in in the city can grow their own produce. You know? Right, right. Well, certainly in the in the interest of relocalizing diets and of not having so much food come from so far away. Uh, if you're talking about urban farming, where I have some experience myself, I, I can tell you that. Well, it's definitely one thing to grow vegetables in the city. It's not really that much trouble. There's all sorts of nooks and crannies where you can just stick them. You know, you can grow broccoli in the strip between the sidewalk and the street if you want to. But if you're trying to raise animals in the, in the city, that's really that that becomes problematic really fast. Yeah. And why would you want to? <laughs> <laughs> right, so. right. Right. I mean, I know I know people who have kept chickens in the city and, and had eggs. That's that's about as far as, as, it, as it seems to be able to go. But there's no way that you could have a cow or a pig or anything like that, like in, 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 in town. You know, I mean, not not no. no, not not where you're also growing all of its feed, you know, you know, because because one, one. Yeah. One thing that I found is that it is a challenge if you're if you're really trying to relocalize a diet and really trying to do everything much more by hand and not with the big machines and not with the large monocrops that there is definitely a challenge to growing the the lentils and the and the beans and you know say quinoa we tried to grow these kinds of things a lot of these things are very very easy to grow and then they're tricky to uh they're tricky to harvest and to process without mechanization or without a community who's willing to come out and do it when it's time and in the current circumstance that we have now, where people have jobs and all this sort of thing, and they're involved with other things, there isn't that that community, you know? Yeah, so this is why I think it's important to, to make a distinction between farming to produce vegetables, or legumes, or grains, huh? right? And, and animal farming. So um, we can also talk about, you know, is is the type of farming that we do for vegetables, is that sustainable or not? And how can it be made sustainable? You know? Right. I was, I saw recently a documentary that was made that ran on, the, on, on BBC in 1976. It was about vegan diets, how to do agriculture without animal uh, fertilizer mm -hmm. from animal waste, the health benefits of becoming vegan and not eating animal proteins. This knowledge has been out there you know, since the 70s. You know? So it's not really 
uh, you know, cutting edge right now anymore to say this, but it is, of course, possible to uh, have a sustainable, we call it a biocyclic, some people call it a bio-vegan system of agriculture that doesn't need any kind of animal waste you know, for fertilization. You, know, you can do it. Uh, you can create the right kind of humus just with a vegetable-based fertilization re regime. It's a little bit more complicated than the three-field agriculture. You know, you, you basically switch to a seven-field agriculture, uh, but it's the, the knowledge is out there. Yeah? We know how to do it, and we, we, you know, people talk about permaculture a lot these days. So this is going to be an interesting and tricky riddle that we have to solve: is how to turn this planet into something that, that is sustainable you know, for, an, let's say, indefinite amount of time. You know? And the current system, of course, is not. <laughs> so no, the, you know, the current system isn't. Many, yeah, I, I know a few people who are trying to do uh, who are who are who are doing veganic. Veganic is the term I hear here most often. Okay. Veganic farming, mm -hmm. and I know people here who are who are trying to do it. When I was involved, when I was doing the urban farming, there was a year. Well, we 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 made up a a complete organic fertilizer mix that we would put in all of our vegetable beds and that we would use throughout the season. And they were usually based on something like cottonseed meal or alfalfa meal, and then we would add like different minerals and we would add uh, lime to lime the soil with and this and that. And then sometimes we would also add like fish emulsion, you know, or something, not fish emulsion, fish, fish meal or something like that into it. Yeah. And I remember that one year we were like, okay, let's, let's, let's do this, this, this vegan. And this was like 12 years ago at this point. And, and, you know, at that point, the big challenge we came up to is that, okay, to make it vegan and to leave out, I believe it was the fish that we were going to do to have a, a plant, uh, the only plant based one that we could find that would take its place uh, was, I think, cottonseed meal that year. But there wasn't a way of guaranteeing that that was a GMO free one. And so it got really tricky right there at that point, because we're like, hmm, OK, what are we what are we going to do here? You know, and I think things have probably changed since then or they will. I think you'll be able to come up with non GMO cotton. But a tremendous amount of the cotton crop is is, you know, is GMO, unfortunately, you know what I mean? And so, so like, I just, you know, I, I just want to say that, that, you know, um, just between all the vegetable gardening, you know, and grains and, 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 and legumes, there are definitely all these challenges that we still, that we still face too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I think this, the, the science is pretty much, uh, has been done. So it just, we, we know how to do it. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, olive tree clippings are among the best vegetable fertilization bases that you can think of. Oh, really? And um, if you actually then after, I think, seven years, the, the humus, you know, you cannot differentiate it uh, at all from animal based uh, fertilization, uh, fertilizer at all. So n not even with an electron microscope can you actually say which humus was you know, originated in animal and which originated in vegetable because it all gets broken down into molecules, right? And so, uh, of course, you cannot trace them back to where they came from. So it's possible we just have to figure out how to implement it. And there, um, I think you, you made an excellent point. It has to be very, very regional. You know? Right. You know, so we have to, to make these supply chains much shorter. Um, we're trying this here with a, a solidaric uh, co-op. We you know everybody has a share. We produce uh, all the vegetables that we need, and then we share it amongst the, uh, each other. So these types of, of systems are, uh, or, or communes or projects are, are popping up all, all over the place, which is a really good thing. And um, yeah, we have to see uh, how uh, we can make this uh, a viable model for everyone. You know? I mean, there's lots of people, for example, in big cities, you know, where, where it's a big challenge. You know? Just the logistics of, of bringing food into a city and and, and everything out of the city that's a, it's a nightmare. You know? Right, right. So the besides the 
the the the logistics and the ethics there there's also the um health issues of it and you know one thing that i've seen over and over again that was always the most convincing to me was then you've seen these too i'm sure there are these tables that show the differences between the physiologies of different kinds of animals including humans so they'll show you the physiology typical physiological traits of a cat and cats are the most exclusively carnivorous of all carnivorous animals. It's my impression. Then they'll show you, say, the, the, the traits of like a cow, you know. Then they'll show you the traits of like a, a monkey or a person or something like that. And, and there's definitely some significant differences there, you know, in the teeth, in the digestive systems, etc., that really seem to point out to humans being... Um, not herbivores, not in the sense that cows are herbivores, that's different, but of us being, um, I believe people usually say, uh, foli folial frugivore is what I've often heard. So leaf yeah. and fruit, fruit eaters, you know? Yeah. This is at least what you can, uh, how, we, how you would classify us from based on our teeth and the length of our digestive tract. Yeah? I, I was very fortunate to be able to meet some of these early vegans that, you know, starting in the 50s, 60s, turned vegan um, for completely ethical reasons. And they were all convinced that they were going to suffer because of it. Oh. They said, we take all the health risk, we take all this sort of, we, we go vegan, despite all the, the health problems we're going to have because of it, because of our ethical beliefs. They had no idea what a wise <laughs> choice right. in terms of nutrition they made. Yeah? And that they're still, you know, incredibly healthy uh, humans now. And um, now, of course, um, I think the, the China study was the biggest nutritional study ever undertaken on mm -hmm. the planet. And many of these findings have been you know, debated over. But the general gist of this study, I think, holds true. And that is... Um, this was uh, the U.S. government started the study. They wanted to help people in the Philippines. They wanted to fight malnutrition, and they looked at supplying more, more um, dairy and more animal proteins to starving people in the Philippines. Now, Campbell, who conducted the study, um, found that all the rich people in the Philippines had lots of health problems. And all the poor people had no health problems <laughs> uh, in terms of certain types of cancer, you know, mm -hmm. liver cancer, stomach cancer. And so this was, and, and he was the son of a dairy farmer. This was so against what they expected to find, you know, that the people with the low animal protein intake were healthier than the people with a high animal protein intake. And we have a similar uh, sort of accidental finding here in Europe. When the Nazis in the Second World War, when they took over Norway, they took all the meat and all the dairy that Norway produced. And the Norwegians became involuntary vegans for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. you know? So they had only uh, sort of an almost completely vegan diet you know, forced upon them. And you can still see the health spike <laughs> that was caused by this. Yeah. You know? In, in, in the longevity data and everything else. So um, there are these sort of accidental findings, but if you go into the, you know, I think this was an honest mistake. Animal proteins are more like our proteins and plant proteins are more different than our proteins. So the idea to say, well, those that are more alike are better for us because we need fewer restructuring operations to make them our own. This was an honest mistake to think they are better for us than the plant-based proteins where we have to perform lots and lots of changing operations, right? You take the amino acids, you cut them apart, you reconnect them to make it your own. And so um, I usually like to, to use this analogy of, of going up and down stairs. So if you run up the stair or you run down the stair, are you more likely to stumble as if you walk slowly? Yeah? And of course, you know, if you walk slowly up and down the stairs, it's a very secure and safe thing. 
and our system is is made for the slow process of slowly turning the proteins into our own and if you do it if the body does it too fast by consumption of animal proteins you stumble and stumbling here just means cancer and stumbling here means also other neurodegenerative uh, diseases like alzheimer's parkinson and all of this stuff so these are you know if you take a, a protein what a protein basically does it, it folds and unfolds constantly all the time and the probability of an incorrect refolding just increases by by the speed factor yeah so it's just uh, let's call it an honest mistake to to think that animal protein was good for us you yeah? um, it's not no yeah? um we can, and this is what the uh, China study showed and other experiments show. Uh, so if it's below 10% of our protein intake, it seems to have no effect. So I make, I, I contribute this to the fact that, you know, when the gorillas, when they eat, take all the leaves, there's the occasional insect. <laughs> so they, they get a, cup, a bit of, of animal protein sort of accidentally. And this is why we can stomach it. You know, we can stomach, uh, even though with a, uh, with dairy, um, we know that many people cannot really stomach it well. You know? But um, the dairy is a, is a yet another issue, which you know, um, apart from the absurdity of consuming another species' mother's milk, you know, that is you know, I, oh, exclusively uh, meant to be given to their offspring. Milk and uh, contains. First of all, lots of growth hormones, right? It makes sense. You want the, the calf to grow fast. So it's filled with these uh, GH uh, com components that basically accelerate growth and they accelerate every type of growth. So if you have an inflammation in your body somewhere, it will be inflamed by giving it, by exposing it to these growth hormones. So it, it causes cascades of inflammation all through your body and this is well known in in, in the field of medicine this is not a secret yeah? but um, you know how they put all these warning labels on cigarette boxes mm -hmm. yeah if, if they you know which is because 29 percent of all the cancer cases are related to smoking there's only one thing that is you know causes more cancer cases and that's dairy yeah Interesting. So if they really, yeah, if they really wanted to be honest, yeah, they would have to put such a warning label on every milk carton, on every piece of cheese yeah, that is being sold. Yeah. So it's 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 highly carcinogenous, and it's also uh, hard to wean yourself off. So I have heard this from vegetarians all the time. They said, "Oh, I could do without anything, but." cheese oh you know i need mm -hmm. my cheese I yep. need it. Yeah. Uh -huh. and you know, i didn't stop eating cheese because i didn't like the taste you know give me an explosive brie you know and and i'm in heaven culinary wise yeah it was not because i didn't like it but um this also may be related to the fact that um milk Cow's milk is, is full of uh, caseomorphins, morphins, yeah? which are meant for the calf to come back to drink and to drink much more than, you know, as much as possible. Yeah? So the calf is sort of made addicted yeah, to the mother's milk, yeah? which is a very clever thing that nature does. You know, it makes uh, sense. But we also, we humans are prone to, to have morphine addictions. Yeah, and if you talk to people who, who, if you listen to people who talk about cheese, you can hear the sound, <laughs> the sweet song of addiction. Yeah? There, I cannot do without cheese. Yeah? And um, of course, in the U.S., this is not a secret that you know you put cheese everywhere. Yeah? Yeah. in the pizza crust and on the pizza and everywhere. Yeah, so, yeah no, yeah. I read about that recently about uh, the opiate effects of cheese that's a measurable thing they have found that like if you find it hard to quit cheese it's because there's a reason for it it's because there is a mild addiction that that goes along with it and that was uh that was the hardest thing for me to give up actually 
you know, personally, like yeah. I, I never really liked beef very much. And so I it wasn't a big deal. You know, I, I, I haven't eaten a fast food hamburger since 1994 or something like that. You know, I just never, you know, missed it. But cheese, that was that was that was the hard one. That was the one that would like yeah. I hadn't eaten any animal products in months. And then someone would bring out some cheese. Oh, I'd, I'd have some. I mean, that that's what it was. And then what it did it for me, actually, what changed it for me on that one was that uh, one day I saw one of these videos that like, you know, the Humane Society of the America put out or, or the paid out or whatever that was showing uh you know, just they were showing the insides of dairy operations and what that what that looks like, you know. And of course, you know, the the cow needs to be pregnant first in order to start making milk, you know, and then they take the calf away, you know. And the video I saw was this this farm where they were just killing the calves afterwards. They just they just pushed all the calves down into this hole that they dug in the ground. And then there was a guy just shooting them, you know, and, 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 and killing them there. And then they were just going to bury them over. And I know that that particular method is not very common, you know, perhaps, you know, but the fact that the calves are taken away from the mothers, that neither the calf nor is the mother likes this, that there is then, you know, a, a torturous life that follows after that for the, for the for the milk producing mama, you know, um, and that the calf itself, you know, often then just becomes veal or becomes, you know, so isn't even allowed to, to grow to be an adult, you know, uh, you know, or, or becomes another becomes another dairy, another dairy cow. So so what I realized was that was that, you know, to be consuming dairy, well, those animals are also killed. Yeah, and it's it's true that there's more animal suffering in a glass of milk than there is in a steak. Yeah, it's it's, it's we have a, we have a retirement home for cows nearby here mm -hmm. um, on the coast, and so these are usually milk cows, uh, but some other cows as well. And a milk cow is finished after four or five years, and then they're turned into minced meat. Literally, yeah, this is what hamburgers are made of. But um, those cows that are lucky enough to, to get into this retirement home, and it's only like 30 some cows that they can, they can sustain there, they get to be 24, 25 years old and older. Wow. They grow. They continue to grow. So you're standing next to a cow and you're looking up and it's almost in the yard until you see their shoulder. So they're huge. And when was the last time you've seen a cow that is larger, whose shoulder height is, is you know, three feet above your head? Wow. It's, it's a rare sight. And there is a, a, a mother and a son. The son is now 16 and the mother is 20. And she will not let him out of her sight. She's <laughs> always positioning herself so that she has a look on what he's up to and whether he's safe. Yeah? So the bond between uh, cow mothers and their offspring is enormous. And after the calves are taken away, I'm sure you've seen this, uh, they, they uh, for days without end, they will call the calf. Uh -huh. and, and of course, and it never comes. So these are extremely social animals. Uh -huh. And to turn them into these uh, milk producing machines is just uh, horrible. Yeah, I mean, from the from in terms of animal suffering, I, I personally consider it to be worse because the cow is may is not merely killed in a really brutal way, as most of them are anyway, but is is tortured, is 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 you know, is confined and tortured for many years first, then brutally killed. You know, I mean, I almost feel like from an ethical standpoint, people should give up dairy first. You know, but it's it's usually it's usually the other way around. But yeah, I completely agree. So both from a health point as well from as from an ethical point of view, dairy might be the the worst. You know? But um, you know, people sort of along this path, they they have they they go on at different at different speeds, right? 
Some people do this first and some people say, well, but, you know, leather is OK because it's a byproduct of the meat, you know, which is not true at all. You know, these are completely different animals that have nothing to do with food production you know, that, that deliver the, the leather. You know? So that's uh, and, and another atrocity. But, you know, some people just say, you know, I, I will still wear my old leather boots because whom am I hurting? You know, if I throw them out, nobody profits. You know, so you, you, you progress at your own speed and you find your point where you feel happy you know, with your life and your decisions. And of course, this is always a moving target. You know? I cannot imagine. So it's your, in a way, your, your tastes and your, um, your feelings change over time. You know? I cannot stomach the, the smell of frying eggs anymore. And even uh, milk and, and cheese odors don't seem attractive after all these years anymore. Uh, it, it takes a while to get to that point. But if you look at how children, human children are weaned onto these products. Yeah? So, you know, if you take uh, children to the supermarket, the supermarket lady, at least here in Germany, will roll up a white sausage and give it to the child for free. You know, have some sausage. Huh? We're really sort of trained to, to like these tastes. That's not a natural thing that for us to like. Yeah? Of course, we have the unami uh, protein receptors, um, which which would uh, fire here. Um, but it's it's really a conditioning process that happens. And um, some people say that you know even for our cognitive development, animals are very important uh, to have this experience as a child to realize there are other sentient and beings on this planet that also move around, that also have intentions. And this is for theory of mind and other cognitive functions is uh, probably also an important thing. So it's amazing what we can think is normal. Uh, I'm sure people during the time of slavery would have thought this is the most normal thing yeah, to have these people with different skin colors be slaves. Yeah? That's the way it's meant to be. This is tradition. This is normalcy. Yeah? And we're sort of prepared to accept almost everything as being normal. Yeah? And it's hard to, to get a change happening, especially if you look at sort of the cognitive science of, of behavioral change. This is a, something that puzzles me. Yeah? So why, why did you embark on this journey? of meat and towards veganism. Right. And you're asking me. Yeah. Oh, well, I think first of all, it was uh it was a health thing from from my standpoint. I was I was had already been getting into organic food and then I decided that I wanted to that that, that I felt like the health the health reason was that was the top reason, you know, to get into that, you know? And then later I started thinking more about the ethics of it and then only much later did i start thinking about the ecological effects of it you know I, it wasn't really until the last few years that i started to think about the environmental consequences you know of it and as for the and i feel like when it comes to the environmental part it's like well that's the part that you just can't argue with you know i mean there are people who would argue as you know, with you all day and all night long about the health, the health parts, you know, and definitely about the ethics parts, you know, and I know some of these people as well, you know, and some of them I respect, you know, for other reasons, etc, you know, but when it comes down to the environmental effects, well, we just, we can't deny that at this point, is that given the dwindling resources of the planet, given the loss of wildlife habitat to agriculture, you know, given uh, how, how water is more and more precious commodity all the time, we, we simply can't afford as cultures to be consuming this many animal products anymore. It's just not tenable. It just absolutely yeah. is not tenable. It has to be cut back. In the United States, it's something like 40% of the cropland is at that moment, you know, given over to, to, to the animal agriculture. And that's just not, that can't be done because, you know, as the climate is changing here, less of that cropland is suitable 
you know? So we'll be working with less as time goes on, if nothing else. And then another thing here in the United States that you don't, this is an issue you don't have there, is that on the public lands here in the United States, the, um, there's a lot of ranching that happens where ranchers lease land from the government to graze their animals, and they get to lease it at a much lower rate than it would be in the free market, you know? And so basically the government subsidizes ranchers to be out on there. And so the ranchers bring their animals out into what are otherwise wild areas. And of course, this has a terrible effect on the native uh, flora, first of all, because the there's all sorts of plants that the, the, the ranch, the, the cattle and the sheep come through and eat first, you know. And so there's plants that become endangered just from them being there. Then there's all the animals who are no longer able to live there because they don't have their food sources anymore. And then there's the animals like especially like the wolves and the bears and etc. who are killed, you know, by the ranchers and in many cases by the state and the federal governments on behalf of the ranchers, you know. And so uh, the effects that we're having on our wilderness here, you know, from having the ranching going on out there are just, it's tremendously deleterious. And it's it, that also, you know, ha has to stop from the viewpoint of, of habitat and biodiversity and, and all of that. Yeah. So let me let me do a quick shout out to Nick and Kate here for a second. So the largest a slaughter of wildlife animals right now is happening in Australia, and that's kangaroos. I had no idea. It's a thing that yeah, it's it's overlooked uh, quite frequently. It's the same situation. You have sheep and and cattle farmers who view kangaroos as a pest because presumably they consume the same uh, uh, food as as the cattle and the sheep. Which actually, again, the science isn't is, is shows that this is not the case. But apart from that. Uh, they're being killed in, in such enormous amounts and they're turned into human meat, pet food or uh, uh, car seats or soccer uh, shoes, you know, their leather. And we have the same problem all over the globe is whenever you have sort of when you put a price tag on a wild animal, you know, it's time to say goodbye to that animal. You know, it happened to right. the rhinos, the elephants. Uh, it's going to happen to fish. Um, so uh, we have to take these out of the market completely yeah, in order to save them. And um, there is a, a wonderful documentary called Kangaroo, a Love-Hate Story. And um, this is uh, a, an in incredible documentary on, the, on this killing, mass killing of kangaroos in Australia. Um, but the uh, other question, so I'm turning the table a little bit on you by asking you these questions. But for me, this is one of the puzzling things. So we know from cognitive science that, you know, we, we like to think that we have beliefs and we have convictions and then we act because of those beliefs and those convictions. Mm -hmm. But cognitive science paints a very, very clear picture that it's the other way around. We act in a certain way, we behave in a certain way, and then we craft our convictions and our beliefs accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is uh, the, the puzzler, right? Because how can you affect a behavioral change? Uh, I remember when I was young, they, they uh, started a law in, in Europe where, where you had to buckle your seatbelt. Uh -huh. right? Before that it was, if you wanted to, you could, but you didn't have to. Now they turned it into a law where you had to do it. And there, there was outrage outrage in the population or oh, free society and nanny state and this and that yeah <laughs> today nobody ever gives a th thought about this you get in the car you buckle up you drive yeah? it's become the most natural thing and everybody would agree yeah that you know it's a sensible thing to do yeah? there's no outrage so behavior change because of a law and now convictions are all have changed accordingly, you know, and it followed suit. And there's the sort of thought experiments, if there was a tick that made you allergic to meat, you know, then people would then say all of a sudden, you cannot eat it anymore. But you would also then start to argue that it's bad to eat meat. You know, and you would you know, t 
adopt the ideology or, or the convictions. So it's really hard to think of, of a natural progression or a system where, where people would sort of make this behavioral change um, and then, you know, uh, come up with the corresponding convictions and beliefs uh, in a post hoc manner. But it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what strategy pans out you know, because all of these different groups all follow very different strategies. You know. So we have the scientific argument, we have the ethical argument, we have grassroots movements, uh, we have the politi political efforts uh, um, by changing laws, but I, I'm, I have no idea which of these measures is going to be the most effective at the end. Yeah. Right. I really cannot tell you. Yeah. The, uh, there is a study in science called complex system science, which you know, studies what kind of networks and complex systems exist on this planet and what their properties are. Uh, the network that we humans form on this, this globe is, is a very common one. It's called a small world network. It has very distinct uh, properties. One property is robustness. Basically, you can hit it with a sledgehammer, nothing will happen. And it's non-linear, which means you can poke it a little bit somewhere and a lot of things happen. Uh -huh. So this is why it's hard to make these, these calculations and predictions. Uh -huh. um, do you remember the, the Arab Spring 10 years ago? Mm -hmm, I do. So you had nine, nine dictators um, all in Northern Africa and in, in the Near East. And, you know, let's go back in time 11 years. Ask any political scientist anywhere in this world, how can we get rid of these dictators? They would have talked about oh, economic sanctions. They would have talked about diplomatic pressure, political pressure. They would have had any amount of theories on how to battle these dictators. I guarantee you, not one scientist would have said, go to southern Tunisia, find this one unemployed youngster pour gasoline over him and set him on fire. If you do this, I guarantee you all nine dictators will topple. Yeah? Right. Which is this, this solitary action of one individual who protested, you know, out of protest burned himself, yeah? that caused a chain reaction that ended in all of these dictators losing their jobs. Yeah? This is not predictable. Yeah? This is hard to... <laughs> to engineer. Yeah? So I don't really know what it takes uh, to, to really affect a, a change on a global scale or even on a national or regional scale. This is why we have decided to try to, to, to pursue as many activity lines as possible uh, right. to do the grassroots activism, to go into politics and to, to work on it uh, from a science scientific point of view as well. Uh, to have as many you say coals in the fire, irons in the fire? Irons in the fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have as many irons in the fire as possible. Right, right. I, I think that's, that's a good approach. And I think that also um, there's this aspect to all of it where, you know, we all collectively believe in this reality and sort of collectively believe that this reality is going to last forever or it feels like it's going to last forever. And so uh, then when something does happen, uh, people are surprised. They spend a lot of time wanting to deny that it's happening. Then they want to spend a lot of time trying to undo that it's happening and try to get back to a normal, even though a normal can't be gotten back to. I mean, we've seen a lot of this during the last year with the COVID thing. And so it's really, it's been apparent to me that that one thing that's useful, no matter what your cause or your interest is, is in getting as many people as possible to see outside the box and to see how they themselves are in a box, how we put ourselves into these boxes, you know, how it is that the reality that we feel is just so permanent, you know, is, of course, fleeting. It's just something that happens to be here you know, right now, you know, that, that, you know, to, to some degree, the, 
to, to a large degree, the things that we believe that, you know, we just believe so strongly or whatever, uh, uh, we believe only because we happen to have been born into a particular time and a particular place. And that that was an accident of fate over which we had, you know, no power in making that decision, at least no power that, I, that I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> And so I feel like that's a lot of what we can do is just to help uh, uh, per perspective, you know, on things. Yeah, the good. I, I think that that's right. The, the question is how how would we get you know this shift in perspective or this um, you know, shifting of context, if you want. But it's uh, how how you change the story. No? Right. I mean, we're telling us a story that this is how it's supposed to be. And uh, we're excellent storytellers as a species. And how do, how do you change the narrative? And the good news is you don't actually need a majority. You, you don't need 51%. Mm -hmm. When you reach 14%, you're, you almost made it because there are tipping points uh, where, where stories change. And it's... Um, for me, still uh, an unresolved issue. Um, I, I, thought, I thought it was fascinating how the field of um, sociology turned empirical with the uh, assumption of the paradigm of game theory. So in game theory, you actually have empirical science. You let people play these these games, like the ultimatum game or the, the prisoner's dilemma game. And so you can test a, a social hypothesis in an empirically controlled setting. And when it comes to getting a bunch of humans together and make them behave in a sustainable and fair manner, they have all failed so far. <laughs> so, uh, we have yet to find the conditions under which a group of humans really would live well together. Yeah. This experiment is still ongoing. Yeah. I remember the, when I read Jared Diamond, when he described how he went to uh, Papua New Guinea to these highlands, where you had about a thousand cultures that had not had contact with the West. Yeah. This was in 74. Yeah. A thousand cultures first contact. Yeah? And these were not only a thousand cultures, but these were a thousand answers to the question of how could we live together. Yeah? Some had marriage systems with three males, two females formed a family, or two males, one male, or, or three females. They had all these permutations yeah, that are possible. Yeah? We think our system is, is the most natural because yeah, that's the story we've been told. <laughs> that's the narrative in which we live. Yeah? Um, but there's so many other solutions. Yeah? And um, as a linguist by training, you know, we have the old story how languages come into existence. And the reason is very simple. It's isolation. There is a mountain range. There is an ocean separating people. And after a couple thousand years, the people on one side of the mountain will have a different language than the people on the other side of the mountain because of isolation. Now, if you take this isolation away, <clears throat> the languages will disappear. And it's happening. You know? So dialects are dying out, languages are dying out. Okay, you know, we can view this as you know, not a big problem. And... Uh, I, I, you know, for a linguist, it might be sad that some languages, you know, are dying out. But the same story goes for cultures. Uh, cultures come into existence because of isolation, and if you take this isolation away, you you merge cultures into something more uniform. And this, you know, if we know that, you know, unless we we go back into an isolated groups of, of, of humans uh, living, you know, apart from each other, unless that happens again, we will have more or less one language and one culture left on this planet. We should make damn sure that it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And 
you know, I was, if you look at the sort of, uh, you can call it the McDonaldification, I mean, how much things start to look alike yeah? all over the globe. Well, if you exit an interstate, you will always find a gas stop, a truck stop, you know, a McDonald's or a Burger King. Or, or, and, and it doesn't matter whether you're in Australia, whether you're in Germany, in France, in Italy, in the US, in Canada, you know, it, it starts to look more and more alike. And um, so uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the narrative is going to be. Um, and what it what we can do to shape it uh, and this is basically what we're trying to do right because that world that you're describing now that that sort of one culture that's been emerging you know has been um there's been an additional aspect that perhaps there wasn't before which is that well edward bernays hadn't lived before and and so the way that advertising and media are shaping the culture and the one worldification of it, I would say is something significant over what happened when, say, the British were forming their empire or when the Mongols were, you know, galloping across the, the steppe or whatever. Yeah, we have. I mean, the, the one thing that has really that's really new that has never happened or was not possible on this planet before is end-to-end -end communication. So you were able to say one-to-one -one communication is possible, one-to-many, you know, the radio, somebody gives a speech and thousands of people listen. But with the media, social media today, you have many-to-many -many, uh, communication, and that's a real novelty. We'll, we'll have to see how that plays out. But the, uh, I think the, if you look at the uh, you know, capitalism and the way I think it has shaped our world. An interesting side note for you, who, who might, uh, might have a uh, you know, humanities background, if you go into the ancient Latin, capitus is uh, the head of a cow. Oh, so, of a cow in particular. A cow head. Yeah? Okay. This is the namesake for capitalism because it was the first form of capital. Of course. For herds, cows. Yeah? And... Um, and so the uh, not only is again sort of the animal uh, husbandry and animal farming uh, sort of the name giver for capitalism, but again I think it's a prototype of having private property, yeah, which again is something relatively new on this planet, mm -hmm. this concept, and um, so I, following you. Your writings, uh, I, I often get inspired by how how far back you go in terms of what we actually all what what do we have to change, you know, how far have, do we have to sort of rewind the tape, you know, in order to come up with a sensible uh, solution or a sensible a mode of of living together, and I'm sure that it's going to be to make people much happier. I mean, this is the good story. Yeah? Right. We're not actually asking people to suffer, but we're asking people to, to get out of this depressing uh, opiate-filled routine they're in right now. And, um, yeah, but uh, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling to think about how much we have to rewind the tape and how to do it. That's another question. So if you want to look at the history of technological regression. So when was there ever a technology that existed where we or the culture or the nation said, we don't want it anymore? We're going back. Huh? We're making a leap backwards. This has happened on the planet, but under very, very rare circumstances only. The prime example is uh, shotguns and rifles in Japan. Okay. So they had shotguns and they had rifle technology. And they used it for a couple of years or decades. And then they abolished them by law and got rid of them for about 200 years. Yeah? And, and you need this isolation yeah? as an island. It was pretty much isolated from, from the rest of the world. You unfortunately seem to need some kind of 
dictator, like an emperor who, right. who can dictate this and <laughs> right. actually right. execute it. Huh? And um, so the idea of how to, to make technological leap backs huh, instead of these this we have to grow, we have to you know increase productivity, we have to technologically advance and advance. How to think about going backwards yeah, is a is a very uh, a hard thing. Yeah? Under what conditions yeah? does a society say you know, looks? Yeah? Let's get rid of them yeah? or whatever. The uh, I'm actually surprised that uh, if you if you go and read Tolkien. But not his uh, not his literature, but his opinions. Um, he said the the root of all, all evil is the uh, the carburetor. They know the combustion engine. That's what he said. The root mm -hmm. of all evil is the combustion engine. When we learn to harness the power of the explosion uh, and turn it, make it, use it for our own purposes. This is when we went astray, according to Tolkien. Right. Uh, so, yeah, it's an interesting question. How how far do we have to rewind the tape? And, or maybe it's it's not simply just a matter of rewinding it, but it's also a matter of picking the right cherries out of the cake you know, or the story. Right. Well, it's a tricky place that we're in because, I mean, one metaphor for where we're living now and how we're living now is imagine that there's some birds who are nesting in a group of trees, you know, and then someone comes along and cuts down all the trees and builds a barn. And so what the birds do is that they then go build their nests in the eaves of the barn, you know. And so, first of all, no one would look at those birds and, and, and berate them for what they've done because they've got nowhere else to go. That's it. There isn't another place that their home was taken from them, you know. Uh, there's no trees to go back to, you know. So in a sense, that's where we find ourselves now. And that's that's part of the challenge is that there is no literal going back in that in that sense, you know, like in yeah, in, in, in building this civilization, you know, first with, you know, starting in Mesopotamia, you know, with the with the, the, the oxen drawn plow and the and the and the cities and then and then the slaves, etc. Private property, writing, the first forms of writing being basically uh counting up cattle, I believe it was, you know, right? That's that's where written language came right? brain. Right, right. Okay, so receipts basically were <laughs> <laughs> was how was how writing started, you know. So you start there and bring us up, and like, well, well, we we can't we can't go back to that in a literal sense, you know. So then it's it's a matter of 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 looking at where we are and how is it that we can, uh, in a sensible fashion, take this apart and dismantle it and go and 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 voluntarily step down to another another a lower level of technology, you know, and. We arguably still have the means to do that now. We arguably still have the resources because it will take resources to take this apart. You know, yeah. it will take resources to make something else which is which is going to work better. And a certain number of resources need to be set aside to um, make sure that the nuclear plants don't just don't just don't just melt down. I mean, this is this is like sort of lurking behind everything is the fact that we have to have electricity right now for, if nothing else, those nuclear plants, because there's several hundred of them which would melt down and make the planet, you know, virtually uninhabitable, you know. So, so, um, you know, as you said, a lot of my writing, you know, is, is really reaching back there. And a lot of people would call it primitivist, you know. You know, uh, and and um, uh, some would call it anarchist as well, in that it's seeking uh, community or people grounds up solutions rather than top down solutions. But I think that probably the situation we're in now is that circumstances are going to force us into doing different things. Yeah, but I I wouldn't maybe say anarchist, maybe anarcho syndicalist. So. Um, and there were some historical examples in Paraguay, in, in, in Spain, in Portugal, where um, 
at least some experiments, you know, in, in, in cultural experiments showed that these systems can actually work. Mm -hmm. They were, yeah. they didn't collapse. They were invaded from the outside and, and torn down. So um, it's possible to come up with solutions. And this is maybe the political me thinking and how do we frame the goals, you know, because we have to have a certain goal and then implement a way uh, and how to get there. You know? And of course, our goals ex are extremely modest at the moment. So we want to reduce all the animals, uh, you know, by 50%. You know? This is nowhere near a solution. It's only halfway you know, right. towards the solution. You know? And it's also not a system change. It's just a reduction. And then, you know, and this, it's a good question that we get asked a lot is if these reformist or welfareist approaches would actually help. You know? I mean, slavery wasn't reformed, it was abolished. Right. You know? It wasn't, you know, oh, let's switch to a four day slave work week. You know? <laughs> or let's, you know, lose, use only, you know, softer whips or whatever. You know, it wasn't through small steps that, that uh, you implemented the change, but it was just abolished. You know? And interestingly enough, or, also not for ethical reasons, but for, for economic reasons. You know, the British thought it was more profitable not to do it than to do it. And so that was the game changer. So in, in a sense, the I think the sort of creative genius that, that hopefully is lurking or is, is already out there thinking about it, will have to come up with a solution where it becomes extremely profitable to do the right thing. Yeah. So where it becomes very profitable to consume less uh, and, and to behave in, a, in an ecological, sustainable manner. And um, you mentioned, for example, the subsidies of, of ranching and, and uh, renting out uh, public land. Um, we're, we're in the process of calculating the subsidies that go into the animal industry. And it's in the same yeah, you know, just think how much money is just just to make these uh, to make bacon yeah? and to make it so cheap yeah? as it is now. Um, this is done by an enormous amount of substitution uh, subsidies that go into this. Yeah? And so these are obvious points where you have to start diverting all these money streams yeah? into to more sensible and more useful and more sustainable uh, enterprises than into animal farming. Yeah. But we have still a long way to go and very little time. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I'm, I'm frustrated as I watch and, and see, you know, the, the, the clock's running down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I pay a lot of attention to the climate news and I pay a lot of attention to the ecological news. And uh, here in the United States, anyway, uh, most of it does not really get covered. Most of it does not really get covered seriously in the mainstream media, even in the serious so-called serious media like The New York Times. I mean, they have an article here or there, you know, CNN talks about it here or there, but they're not talking about it in a way in which they're really conveying just how big it is, you know, and just how fast it's moving and just how much it affects everything about what we're doing. Like in that sense, I, I really consider most of the media in the United States to be climate denialists. Yeah, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's hard uh, to, you know, the notion of a tipping point or the notion of exponential change, it, it's, it's hard to grasp. Yes, it is. And, and we're not, we're, as a species, we're not made to think in long-term long perspectives. We're, we're awfully bad at these types of, of things. You know? you know, so I get up today and it's okay. And I get up tomorrow, it's okay. So I assume it's going to be okay you know, the day after tomorrow. So again, we're... We have to find the right conditions under which we sort of the right behavior emerges naturally, just like we formed conditions where exactly the wrong type of behavior emerges. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just what these conditions are, uh, you know, 
we have to find out. Right, right. And we have to do it soon. Right. Well, in the interest of kind of wrapping this discussion up, um, what would you what would you like to encourage people to do? What positive things would you like to see people do? Well, to become more sociable is, of course, exactly the wrong. <laughs> so, uh, but I think uh, we need uh, we're a social animal, yeah? and so we need a peer group. You know, we need uh friends we need uh people who are companions so i think it's it's the uh, the 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 coldness that is creeping through through the society is 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 by and large accompanied by by loneliness a very fundamental loneliness i think and this concept of alienation um that marx is talking about is my maybe much more persuasive than even he would have thought. So um, we have to de-alienate ourselves. You know, the, so to get back in touch with, you know, you know, the first object I'm looking at is a chair. And I know that this chair was made by, by the, the grandparents of my wife. So she has a very intimate relation to this chair. Yeah. And and so she values she values it um, because of that, and um, so we have to to start valuing things again, I would say, you know, and find ways to to value. It's interesting. So I um, my relationship to salad has changed. I'm, I'm much more careful when I prepare salad in terms of trying to save every possible leaf you know, and not throw away something that is you know, still good to eat. You know? right. So this is a sort of a, a conservatism, if you want, that is really positive you know, in, in, in the original sense of the word. You know? So, um, yeah, go for a multi-pronged attack. Uh, do all that you know and try all that you don't. So this is, <laughs> <laughs> of course, you, you know the quote. Um, yeah, and um, stay positive while doing it. Yeah. It's uh, maybe an interesting uh, last uh, note. Have you? It's a. It's a something called the Texan housewife dilemma. Have you heard about that? I don't think so. It's a, it, Psychology. Um, so interesting name, the Texan housewife dilemma, because it comes from a study that was conducted in Texas. Why Texas? Because Texas is a very traditionalist state, and you have the typical family roles still happening a lot there, where the male member goes out to earn money and the female member stays at home and, and does all the housework. And so they did a study with these housewives, and they asked them, what is the most important and valuable thing in your life? No? And they all agreed children. Raising children is the most meaningful, pleasant, best thing of, of all of it. And then they asked them also at the same time to keep a half an hour diary. So every half an hour they had to write down what they're doing and how they feel about it. No? And so they had things like bringing this kid to, to kindergarten, preschool, dropping him off, picking him up, washing dishes, washing clothes, doing this. And, and all of it was labeled as shitty. You know? They did not like a single one of these activities. And the dilemma that the psychologists that discovered was how can something that consists only of really shitty stuff <laughs> in some be the most meaningful and valuable thing yeah yeah and i get the same feeling when we're standing in front of these slaughterhouses this is not a pleasant thing to do uh -huh. but it becomes a valuable thing because you attribute meaning to it uh, because you you think it makes sense to do this uh -huh. and it's, it's the meaning of, of raising for example a child that makes it sort of 
that explains this dilemma. Yeah? How is something that can only that consists of, of really stupid stuff that is not fun at all, how that together can be the most uh, valuable and the best thing of your entire life. So I would say, you know, even though the, the individual steps and bits and pieces might not be so pleasant uh, on our journey, the whole thing itself is extremely rewarding yeah? because it's meaningful. Yeah? So I would invite everybody to, to embark on a journey and, and change behavior and see where, where it goes. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.